up to the March new networking lunch for Spanish Fork Salem Chamber of Commerce. My name is Matt Harrison with MLA Cheating Cooling, and I'd like to welcome everybody out. And we got a pretty good turnout today, so thanks for spending your lunchtime with us. I want to thank uh, UVU for sponsoring this event today, and Steve Anderson, I appreciate that. I uh, wanted to give you an update on a couple of things that are happening. Um, you may have heard that we are the largest university in the state now, uh, just under 40,000 students, uh, and still growing. Uh, we just came out of the legislative session, a very successful session. We received funding for a new business building, which will help us tremendously. So uh, we have the largest business school in the state. One out of four business graduates that come out of Utah graduate from UVU. So we're really excited about that. <clears throat> um, and again, just happy to be here. And uh, thanks, Matt. Hey, let's give Steve a round of applause for sponsoring us. We couldn't can, do this without you, and we want to thank UVU for, for doing that for us. All right, well, since I'm going to now uh, turn the time over to Ari Bruning. Did I, did I, I said it? Ari. Anyways, I want, real quick, just a few things about him. He grew up in West Valley, uh, and... He actually, he has four kids. He did go to BYU, but it wasn't good enough for him, so he actually went to Harvard Law after that. <laughs> no, actually, he, went, he was a BYU student, and then he went to Harvard Law. He's a graduate, a graduate of Harvard Law. Uh, he was a real estate attorney, but now he is with, and he did many other things, and I'll just let him get into that. But he is now with a vision, he's with Envision Utah, and he's the COO there. So let's just go ahead and turn the time over to him. And welcome you here. Thank you. So thanks for having me. They asked me to come down and talk a little bit about the Valley Visioning Project for Utah County. Um, so hopefully you've heard of Valley Visioning before. And this isn't completely new to you. But I uh, thought I'd start with a little bit about Envision Utah and what our role in it is. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we were started in 1997 by a number of people, including Governor Levitt at the time, uh, Larry Miller was involved. Um, people were looking at growth issues in the state and saying, I'm not sure where this is gonna take us. How can we make sure we have a high quality of life even as we grow? And that was 1997, and they were establishing a vision for 2020. So we're almost there. And <laughs> the projection was we were gonna add a million people by 2020. They hit it almost on the nose, um, and then did a whole bunch of scenarios, engaged the public, and a lot of what came out of that was um, people wanted to build light rail and commuter rail, and so people went forward to do that, and we're pretty much hitting the vision for, for that. We've built 140 miles of rail, we're building development around the rail stations, so that was kind of the vision. So, um, so the idea behind Envision Utah is to engage the public and ask the public how they want to grow. Um, but to give them educated choices. So they're giving us educated responses, right? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we do that. So this, I'm glad we had Panda Express today because I took a picture of my Panda Express fortune a few months ago. This is why Envision Utah does what it does. So what future do we want? Let's go make it real rather than leaving it to chance. That's kind of the idea. There are gonna be a lot of decisions made between now and 2050. Um, whether it's government zoning decisions or infrastructure investment decisions or private decisions um, in your own life or in uh, development and so on, let's all get on the same page and head towards the same target. That's the idea. So we are here working in Utah County partly because a few years ago we did, we did crunch the numbers on where the land is available on the Wasatch Front. So, I'm going to zoom in on this map. So the reds and yellows are where there's a available, developable land. Salt Lake County, this is hard to see, isn't it? 40,000 acres left. So not a lot left. Give it 20 years, it's all gone. Utah County, you've got 240,000 acres left. So pretty simple geography. <laughs> Growth is headed your way. There, there will be infill and redevelopment in Salt Lake County. But How does that number get tallied? What, what kind of land are you calculating? Uh, so we take out already developed land, we take out steep slopes, wetlands, Forest service. Uh, federal land. I think that's about it. And everything else is just free. So private there, land is private included. Private land is included, yep. 
your farm's in it. <laughs> so the result of that is population growth projections, you're already seeing it. So the, let's see, the red on there is actual, and then the white hashed is projections. Um, so by 2050, you're adding, I think you're basically doubling in population by 2050. By 2065, you're adding a million people. So think about that. You're basically taking the population of Salt Lake County and adding it to Utah County. Isn't that frightening? <laughs> so now, it might be a little encouraging to know this isn't anything new. You doubled in the last 20 years. So, and you turned out okay. So, and it's not just people coming in. So the projection is that 85% of your growth is going to be children and grandchildren of people who already live in the state. So I, I have four kids. Would not surprise me if some of them ended up living here. So I'm the problem. <laughs> yeah, anybody else who has more than one kid, you're the problem too. Yeah. And that projection is that of all the new growth in the state by 2065, one out of every three new people will live here. Utah County. So that's why we started looking at Utah County at the same time all of the chambers in Utah Valley were thinking about the same growth issues and saying we, we should do something. We should figure out how we want to accommodate that growth in a way that maintains a high quality of life. So uh, the chambers came together, UVU was involved, talked with us and, and said let's, let's launch the Valley Visioning. Um, and we view ourselves as staff and facilitators to the effort. So the people of Utah County are the ones who get to decide where you want to go. We just, we just help and provide the information and so on. Um, we have a number of funders. Um, we probably need to update this. I think it's not quite all of them. Let's shift that over a little bit. Um, and if you're interested, we're still trying to raise money. So um, the chairs of the effort are Val Hale, the head of the Governor's Office of Economic Development, who lives in Utah County, and then Cameron Martin, your boss, at UVU. So, and then we have a very large steering committee that you probably can't read that includes, <laughs> includes a representative of every one of the chambers, so, as well as mayors and a number of others. And we kicked it off with a, th a three-phase process. So the first phase is what we're doing right now. We're going around asking people, what are the things you care about, what are you worried about, and what are your ideas for how we could grow? And then we take that, and in the second phase, we put together scenarios. So we say, in 2050, you said you wanted to grow this way. Well, let's run it through the travel demand models, see what it does for traffic, see what it does for air quality, uh, water, everything you told us was important to you. And we'll do a few different scenarios, and then we'll bring that back to everybody. And they'll tell us what they like and don't like about the scenarios. And then the steering committee will take that information and form the vision based on that. So that's the goal. And the goal is to have as many people as we can weighing in on the scenarios. So we're hoping that in, probably in the fall when we bring the scenarios back that you'll all help us get the word out for people to either come in person or go online and weigh in on those scenarios. So, um, so we kicked it off November, I think, at UVU. Anybody here who was there? Yeah? A few of you were there. It was a fun time, wasn't it? I think we had almost 200 people. And then we did uh, nine workshops around the county. We did one here. I don't remember exactly. We were in the high school, that's right. Spanish Fork High School. Um, and had a lot of fun, so we put people around maps, and we gave them, I think it's 700,000 additional people that they had to accommodate in the county, and said, put it on at whatever density you want. We gave them three different densities they could choose. Show us where you'd put it, how you'd put it. You can draw on their roads and rail and all that. And it's a lot of fun to have to try to fit that many people. So anyway, we're going to take that and do scenarios. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of some of the kinds of things that we think about as we do scenarios. So we're hearing traffic is basically the number one issue so far. So traffic is largely related to jobs and housing and how close together they are. So in Utah County right now, let's see if I get these numbers right, you have about 50,000 people who commute into Utah County every day and about 75,000 who commute out. So net loss of 25,000 people, basically going north. Most of them are going north. Right? So 
to think about scenarios. How do you get the jobs and the housing closer together? And it's not that everybody's going to walk to work, right? But the closer together they are, the, the shorter trips tend to be. Of those 75,000 that are leaving Utah County, if they are going north to Salt Lake and beyond, they're probably living on the north side of the county. A lot of them are living on the north side, right? Probably 80%. Yeah. I know people in Houston are going to stop Yeah, not all of them, but a lot of them are north. <laughs> Yeah. The good news is the jobs are coming, right? Um, you've probably seen the headlines that Utah County, number two in the country for job growth. So the population is coming, but so are the jobs. That's good news, right? You want those jobs. Um, and there, you got the employment projections basically tracking the population. So again, doubling by 2050. So that's a good thing. Um, one other thing we do is we model these is another thing that moves the needle is not just the jobs and the housing close together, but uh, communities where people can live, work, and play in the same community. So you may not, you know, I mean, maybe you just live there and don't work there, but you can still walk to a restaurant at night, right? You're not getting on the roads to go somewhere. Um, and here are some examples we like to show. I live in Daybreak, I think it's on there. Yeah, Daybreak. Um, so living the dream, right? Not working in Daybreak, I'm working right here. Um, so the idea of these mixed use centers is you can get from one use, and by use I mean think shopping could be a use, or offices could be a use, or housing could be a use. You can get from one to another on a local street. So you don't have to go out on that big arterial. And what that does is, first of all, it keeps traffic off the big arterial. And the second thing it does is it makes it easier to walk or bike. So people don't like to walk or bike on a big arterial, surprisingly. Right? So, these are the kinds of things we'll look at in scenarios, and some people put them on maps, other people didn't, so we'll study different options. Um, as you mix those uses together, you can mix them in the same building. You don't have to. You can put them next to each other, or down the street from each other. Um, and at, you can do them at different scales, too. So downtown Salt Lake City is a mixed-use, live-work-play community. Most people don't want to be downtown Salt Lake. <laughs> Downtown Provo is a little bit lower scale, right? But there are also much smaller places that can be a live, work, play community. It could just be a, a few shops on a corner, or it could be even just a school in a park at the center of the community that people can walk to. So mixed uses, right? Recreation as well as housing. And what it does, I don't think you can read that, but studies show that uh, in those places, uh, driving is reduced by about 20%. So think about that. Get 20% of the cars off the road. That opens it up for you to drive, your SUV. There you go. <laughs> and then the trips that leave those mixed-use communities, let's see if I get the number right. It's about a quarter of the ones that leave are not on a car. So they could be on a bike or a bus or whatever it is. So take another 25% of the trips off the road. So it makes a big difference. I mean, not everybody wants to live there, but some people do. And I'll actually show you the number who do. Um, another thing we're looking at in these scenarios is, is the connectivity of the street network. So I mentioned the two uses you can get to on a local street. A lot of the reason you can't is that we, do, we build a cul-de-sac community off of the arterial. The only way to get anywhere is to leave that community on the arterial and then go somewhere because the street network's not connected. And so you do studies, studies show that a connected street network has a bigger difference on traffic than anything else. Brigham Young got it right. It's that grid system. <laughs> um, and it also, again, makes it more walkable and bikeable because you have more direct routes and things. Another thing to look at is development near transit. So we've made some investment already, right? We have Front Runner. We now have UVX. Um, to maximize that infrastructure, if you develop it fairly high density around it, that makes people be able to walk, walk to it and use it. Um, so we pulled the numbers. We just built 140 miles of rail on the Wasatch Front. And since 2010, these are building permit numbers. Um, what is it? 43% of the uh, multifamily housing that's been built on the Wasatch Front has been built within a half mile of a rail stop. So you think about that. Those are people who maybe don't need to own two cars. They only need to own one. Um, a lot of their trips, they can walk to the rail stop and get somewhere. Um, I was surprised by some of these other numbers, like 37% of the office square feet and 30% of the retail square feet. That surprised me. 
But that means not only can you start your trip from your house, but you can get somewhere, right? So that makes a big difference. And we calculated, based on those numbers I showed you for reduced driving, all that development is about 650,000 miles taken off the road by people who can now take the train instead. So another thing to look at in scenarios. We're also going to be looking at housing. We're hearing that's a big issue. Surprise, surprise. Um, Utah likes to lead the nation. We're top five for housing price increases. <laughs> I don't think we want to lead, lead the nation in that. In fact, and if you go all the way back to 1991, we're, we're what are we, fourth? In the housing price increase since 1991. Um, now, there are probably a lot of reasons for that. A lot of, you have declining land supply, which drives the cost of land up. Um, we have construction costs significantly increasing both labor and materials. A lot of things going on that are driving that. Um, and as a result, we're building different products than we used to. So this shows, if you can read it, <laughs> along the bottom is uh, year built. And this is building permit data. Along the top is the the blue line is single family detached product. And then the orange line is everything else. So townhomes, condos, apartments. So this is Utah County. It used to be about 3 quarters single family detached. Recently, it's been closer to 50-50. So surprise anybody? A half your units are attached product. And again, it's affordability. People just can't afford that yard. There's probably also a little bit of changing preference, too. Millennials are a little more likely to want to live in an apartment or something and not take care of a yard. But most of them still want a yard, though. Now, this is Salt Lake County. They've actually completely flipped now, so it's about two-thirds attached product being built. So you're not quite like Salt Lake County. And thinking about affordability, one other thing to think about is transportation costs. So AAA estimates, I think, are about a little under $10,000, I think, to own a car for a year, own and operate it. It's an average car. So if you're a typical Utah family with two cars, you're spending $20,000 on just getting around. And median household income is, what, 67000 or something? So almost a third of your income is just being able to get around. And so, you know, there's building permits near train stations where maybe you can get, get away with only one car or no cars, or you have two cars and you just drive them less. Those kinds of things make it more affordable for people to live. Um, one other issue we're going to look at is agriculture, your farm. <laughs> Believe it or not, Utah County is number one in the state for agriculture receipts. You beat out Cache County, you beat out Beaver County, you beat out Millard County. You're also number one in the state for growth. How are we going to replace that, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, what do you do about that, right? <laughs> and, and it also raises the question, do you grow south where the ag land is? Do you grow west where there's no water but there's no ag land? Or at least there are some dry farms, I guess, but you know, balancing questions, right? So those are just a few things we're thinking about. So. I want to show you some of the survey results we're getting so far. So how, how many of you have taken the survey? Less than half. <laughs> it's at uh, utahvalleyvisioning.org. So go take it. Invite all, everybody else to take it, too. All your customers, friends, whoever. Uh, we want as many people to take it as we can. We've had, I think, about 2,600 take it so far. Um, and spread pretty well throughout the county. Um, so geographically, it's looking like matches the demographics pretty well. Age-wise, we're doing pretty well other than the younger demographics, so the UVU students, we need more of them. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty good age demographic. Um, now, before I show you the results, I want to show you our survey result from 2014. This is a statewide. We asked them, do you think growth will make things better or worse? So 2014, can't even read it, 42% said it'd take, it'd make things better, 35% said it'd make things worse, and then 23% said, I don't know. So a plurality said growth would make things better. This is what we're seeing in Utah County now, 58% saying it'll make things worse. 
So I'm, I'm not surprised by that. We've had a lot of growth. <laughs> it is a little concerning to me, though. Is, you know, if the, if the response to that is, go lobby my city council to not allow any growth, well, guess what? Your city council doesn't cause growth. <laughs> if you want to know what causes growth, go ask your seventh grade health teacher. <laughs> so California tried to stop growth by not approving building permits, and that's part of the reason their housing costs so much. It's just simple supply and demand. <laughs> So, oh, sorry. Just a little minute. Anyway, a little, little concerning finding. So the question is, how, how do you accommodate the growth and not make things worse, right? Because it's our own kids, it's our own grandkids. Um, okay, and we also asked them to pick the, the three attributes of life in Utah County that have the biggest positive influence for them. And we came up with this list based on interviews with people. Um, though what's rising to the top are three things that have to do with the people in Utah County. So it's the values and morals of the people. So there are good people here. It's, uh, it's family and kid friendly. And then uh, there are safe neighborhoods. So all three of those are just related to the people and the culture. People just like the people here. It's a great place, right? <laughs> and the second category of things that's rising to the top is about the economy. So it's a strong economy, I can get a good job, and it's an affordable place to live, which is starting to change some. It's still more affordable than Salt Lake County, though. Um, and then the third thing has to do with the nature and the outdoors, so outdoor recreation and scenic beauty. And this is actually fairly consistent with what we see statewide. That's what people love about Utah, it's why they're here. It's the people, it's the economy, and it's the outdoors. Now we asked him, okay, what don't you like? And rising to the top, traffic and congestion, followed by air quality. So when we did this statewide in 2014, it was air quality by far. It was the number one negatives for people in the state. I think all the growth has pushed traffic higher. And the air is actually getting cleaner. Okay, and then, and then we asked them to rate from one to 10 different topics and how important it is for us to focus on those as we think about growth. Um, everything's rating pretty highly, but coming out at the top, manage water. That surprise anybody? We actually find if you give people a list, they put water at the top. If you don't give them a list and just ask them what's important, they don't even think about water. <laughs> But yeah, so big issue, we're gonna work with uh, Central Utah Water Conservancy District and others to model scenarios and say if you grow here, where do we find the water? If we grow there, where do you find the water? Those kinds of things. Um, and then second, transportation, air pollution, education, jobs, housing affordability, and then agriculture and open space, your farm. So, so basically we're using this, what we're gonna do is put together some uh, working groups on these topics, and their job will be to frame the scenarios that we can help, that we can bring back to the public. So, I don't know nearly as much water as about water as Central Utah Water Conservancy District does, but they can help us model what happens with water. So. Okay, one other thing we're asking people: Where would your ideal community be if you could pick anywhere to live? What kind of place would it be? And you'll see, first of all, they're all over the place. They want a whole variety of things. The two blue ones there, the two biggest blue ones, are basically single family neighborhoods, just different densities. So about half say single family neighborhood, but it's only half. The ones that we circled in yellow there, so what is that, 42%? That's something more mixed use and walkable. So biggest chunk of that is something like Daybreak or Vineyard, uh, kind of a, I don't know what you'd call that, an amenitized suburb kind of thing. Um, and then you have, 10% in that purple saying low density urban. Just think of the avenues. And then you have 12% saying downtown Provo, like something like that. So it's 12% of the housing, something like that, right today? Not even close. So, and so we actually we cut this one by age because we were really curious. And lo and behold, millennials are more likely to pick those urban places. 
Okay, then we, we ask people where should growth happen. We give them 100 points and let them allocate it across different sectors of Utah County. They spread it everywhere. With the west kind of a little bit higher, and then infill development being the next one. Infill development in existing cities. Now, if you asked them infill development in your city, maybe you'd get a different answer, but I don't know. <laughs> so, but basically, they spread it everywhere. That's what they've been doing at the workshops, too, is they put it on the maps. They tend to spread it all around. And then we asked, um, gave them 100 points again and said, how much should we invest in each transportation type? And so roads kind of edge out transit by a little bit, not by a ton. Local roads, regional roads, regional transit, and then local transit, like a bus comes in last, but not by a lot. Um, and then on each of the topics we knew were going to be the top, we, asked them, we gave them a list of strategies and had them rate each one 1 to 10. So on transportation, we gave them this list that you can't read. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting to me that the top two strategies on there uh, that people are ranking high are, I think, improve community walkability and bikeability, and then increase investment in roads. So people are basically saying, I want to be able to drive, and I also want to be able to walk. I want, I want both. Um, and then next is public transportation and new technologies like car sharing and autonomous vehicles, those kinds of things. Okay, and then on water, here's the list we gave them. Um, number one strategy people are rating is uh, reducing water use per capita. So more water-wise landscaping, those kinds of things. Um, followed by provide more storage facilities. So you can see what people are thinking about. Um, much lower is uh, repurpose agricultural water. So they want to keep the water on your farm. And this is, we've seen that for a number of years now. Every time we ask, people say, I'd rather take the water from my yard than from a farm. If we need water for growth. Um, okay, housing affordability. Uh, the two that are tied there are, the top one is facilitate housing development near, how's it worded, near public transportation, jobs, shopping, and amenities to reduce household transportation costs, and then allow a full range of housing that matches what people of various life stages can afford. And the one that nobody likes at all there is reduce regulations and fees. Go figure. <laughs> OK, uh, I think this is the last survey result we have here. Strategies for growing and attracting good jobs. I don't know how sophisticated the public is at this one, but it's interesting what they think. Uh, number one there is uh, manage transportation. So make it so people can get, people and goods can get around. Makes sense to me that that promotes strong economy. Um, and then about almost tied with it is ensuring adequate water supplies. I guess that makes sense to me too that if you don't have enough water, jobs aren't going to come. I don't know. And then uh, I don't know what's next. Yeah, air quality, yeah, that's very high. Improve air quality. By the way, we did a survey of Silicon Slopes employees and asked them what's the most likely reason you'd want to leave Utah, and air quality was number one. Um, and then following that is improve the education and skills of the workforce. So that's what you guys do. Anyway, that's, those are the kinds of things we're finding. Um, so these are the kinds of results we'll give to those work groups to explore the different strategies and do scenarios. Um, we're taking all the maps from the workshops, and we digitize them. We create maps like these, show where people put things. Um, transportation, we're seeing a lot of bridges across the lake, for example. Um, let's see, employment, housing. You can see housing spread everywhere. So we'll take those. We're looking for themes so we can do scenarios. And again, that's the next step, scenarios. So with that, um, we have a few more workshops we're doing. I think the, this is an old slide. We did the Adobe one the other day. We're doing Ancestry tomorrow with the Ancestry employees. Um, 
we're looking at adding a workshop with UVU students and then a uh, one in Spanish. So, and then uh, we'd like to get as many survey results as we can in before the April 17th uh, uh, chamber event so that we can tally all the results, report back, and have people there help us think through where we go from there in terms of scenarios. So that's where we are. So if you haven't taken the survey or pushed it out, now's the time. And this is my last slide before I take questions. This is why you plan ahead. It'll take you a second. The driveway is just for storing your, your uh, garbage can. <laughs> you can four wheel drive into your, into your garage. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's true. It's just for storage, right? <laughs> That's right. So that's where you can fi find the survey and more information and yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll just close with, with one thought, which is we've sat down with a few uh, commercial real estate developers and to a person they all say Spanish Fork is the center of South Utah County. And, and wh what you want that to mean I think is up to you. But I mean, do you want to be downtown South Utah County? I don't know, what do you want to be? So I'll just leave you with that yeah, thought. Let's give